Hi, welcome to another video. Uh, today, I don't want to bore you to death with table saw uh, conversation, but I do want to point out something that I've seen many, many times, and it's a little on the scary side for me, so I wanted to show people uh, how to run a piece of wood through your table saw when there's not a whole lot of distance between the fence and the blade, and do it safely. Uh, I've seen uh, videos uh, where guys are running a four inch wide board or the boards, you know, let's say five inches wide, but their finish size is four inches and they're running it through their table saw with a push stick. Not a great idea because the reason uh, is that it's not called a hold down stick, it's called a push stick. If your blade is even the little slightest bit dull, and all you're doing is pushing from the back and your board is going to rise up on the blade and throw it right in your face. It can be really dangerous. I think the reason that I'm seeing that is because the people who have not been, uh, you know, taught in their trade, but it's their home taught, uh, they're fearful of the equipment. So they want to stay as far away from the blade as possible. In this case, when you're running a, you know, when you want to finish board four inches wide and you're running it with a push stick, your hand can easily pass between your fence and the saw blade without any fear whatsoever. But my attitude is if you fear the piece of equipment, don't use it. And the other thing I want to stress is always maintain really sharp equipment. Uh, make sure that blade is sharp. As soon as it starts to show signs of getting dull, change it out. It's not worth losing a finger because you wanted to get a little bit more life out of your table saw blade. And I want to talk about the table saw blade after I show you me running this through with a, about a 1 and 7 8 inch span between the blade and the fence and do it safely. I'll show you a little tip. Every one of these fences has a lip on it, whether it be a Bessmeyer fence or in this case a shop fox. It's got about a half an inch lip. What I was taught and what I do is I run my fingers up against that fence so that when I'm pushing the board through, if that board kicks, my hands are locked, my hand is locked in up here, my fingers are not going into the blade. And I'll, get, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Now, this piece isn't close enough to the blade for me anyway to worry about locking three fingers. I'll probably just lock two. But that's just me. I don't suggest doing this unless you're a professional and you really are comfortable with your table saw and you and yourself in doing this. But I'm going to show you the safe way to run this through. And the reason I do it this way is because I can really hold down the piece while I'm pushing the piece through because my hands are involved and not the push stick. So let me go ahead and show you that. I'm not going to turn on my dust collection. I'm just going to turn on the table saw so that I keep the noise down. So, I hope uh, anybody that's, you know, going to run a piece through a table saw and wants a comfort level hears that and sees this little tip so that they can say, okay, I think I can, I can try that but I'm not suggesting you do it if you're not comfortable doing it. Only do that if you're really comfortable with your equipment. Okay, onto the, onto the table saw blade. Let me show you something. Um, this table saw blade that I have on there right now is an 80 tooth blade. Now, most people would say, why are you using an 80 tooth blade? 80 tooth blades are normally used for cross cutting because they give you a really nice clean cut. Uh, you know, you could use a 60 tooth or even a 40 tooth for ripping. And that's very true. But I buy these blades so cheap that I can afford to throw it away. And uh, the cost of sharpening it is, in my case, more than the cost of a new blade. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Um, I happen to be in Arizona, and the town I live in, even though the population is quite large and the surrounding towns are quite large, we don't have anybody in the area that sharpens tools. So if I wanted that saw blade sharpened, I would have to drive 40 miles twice, 80 miles both directions. So to give you an idea, 40 miles away to drop off the blade, 40 miles back home, 
When it's done a week later, 40 miles to go get it and 40 miles back. And this blade is $16 and change, an 80 tooth blade. Let me show it to you. I get these from Amazon. This, the company that makes this particular blade is, a, is Concord. And it's an 80 tooth blade, 5 8 arbor, 10 inch, $16 and change. I'm going to put the link in the video so that if you want to run to uh, uh, Amazon and grab a bunch, uh, it's, uh, you'll probably be very happy with them. They're not cheaply made blades. They're very good blades. They'll last you a very long time. I stumbled across it, and I was happy as can be that I did. Okay, uh, now let me show you how I make my drawers. I think uh, you'll find it interesting. Okay, here's a typical drawer that I make. And I'm going to show you the difference between what I do and what I normally see. You'll notice that there, this isn't a box with a drawer face screwed to it. This has the drawer sides buried into the face of the drawer. What I do is, in this case, the drawer thickness is three quarters of an inch. The drawer sides are half inch Baltic birch. They're extremely rigid, great for drawer sides. And what I do is I will plow out a half an inch dado into the drawer to accept the drawer sides. And I will turn around and when I go to assemble the drawer, of course there's a dado in the, to accept the drawer bottom. Uh, what I'll do is I'll glue this all home and then I run a one inch brad nail with my nail gun through the drawer side into the drawer face on an angle, both sides. Uh, this one happens to have three on each side the wider the drawer uh, side, the more nails I'll put in it. But all you see is a little tiny hole on the inside edge of the drawer. And together with the glue and those nails being toenailed half inch into the drawer face, uh, that drawer is not going anywhere. I've made drawers like this for, oh, probably 20 years. I've never, ever had one come back to me or have one fail, and I've made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. So anyway, this is my technique. And then to decorate the face, what I'll do is I'll take a quarter of an inch piece of wood that's a little bit wider than my drawer face, and I'll bullnose it and miter it and fasten it to the drawer face, gluing it home, and it acts as a nice decoration. And this is the way I make my drawers. Now, let me show you how I make my doors. Here's a leftover piece that I made for something. I forget what it was, but it just left over, and I hated to throw it away, and I decided to keep it, and it turned out great, because now I've got something to show you, the finished product. This isn't a door. This happens to be an end panel, but the door would be made the same way, except the dimensions, uh, the style, thick, the width, and everything would be a little bit different, style and rails. Um, so what I do is, if you'll notice, there's a V-groove here, and you take a look at that and you say, well, it's a panel with a bunch of V-grooves cut into it. No, really it's not. Let me show you. Here's one of the slats that form my door panel. Quarter of an inch thick, and then what I do is I run a chamfer on the edges of the board, and insert a few of them together into a channel that I cut into the frame before I assemble it. And so they're locked into the middle of the door and they allow to float. So as the humidity level ex uh, uh, changes, in, the wood will expand and contract and not buckle or, or you know, move and expose anything. Uh, you know, for instance, if you stained it and, and it shrunk really bad, uh, what will happen is you'll expose a white line or, or an unfinished line where the piece shrunk. In this case, uh, each panel will shrink less than a 64th of an inch because they're not very wide. And you'll notice then that uh, it's a decorative look, but it also has a function, and that is to maintain this look forever. And so that's how I do my slats. Now, the thing about these slats is you're not going to go out and buy quarter-inch material somewhere. Nobody has it. You have to make it. And there's a couple of ways you can make it. You can, if you have a really good bandsaw and a planer, you can go ahead and re-rip your 
three quarters of an inch piece of wood in half and then plane it down to a quarter of an inch. I haven't gotten myself a planer yet or a bandsaw. That's down the road. And meanwhile, I'm building my house and I want to get my cabinets done, so I have to take the long route and the tedious route. I will adjust my fence so that it's a quarter of an inch away from the blade. If I'm making a three inch wide slat, I will adjust the, depth of the height of the blade to about halfway through the board or about an inch and a half. And I'll run it through and then I'll turn it around and I'll run it through again. So I've got two slats started. I raise up the blade and then I run it through again. So now the blade is sticking up three inches and I run it through again, both directions. And now I have two slats. And once I've got however many slats I need to make done, then I'll set my width for whatever I need the width of the slat to be, and I'll run them through again. And what I end up with is a little sliver of wood in the middle. Really tedious, but I've got an 80 tooth blade on there, which gives me a really smooth cut in, on the back of the slats. That's handy because when you're making a door, when you open the door, you're going to see the back side of the slat. So you don't want a groove cut into it or a bunch of burn marks from the table saw blade or, or anything else you want a clean look. So you have very little sanding to do on the back side of these once you make them. And of course, I don't start out with a three inch wide board if I'm going to cut three inches in depth. I'm going to start out with a board that's maybe three and a half or three and three quarters so that when I run it through, I don't have to worry about the blade coming through. And it creates a little bit of a waste, uh, but that's okay for me, I don't mind. So that's how I make my doors and, and my end panels. And I'm working on a laundry room cabinet and I'm gonna drag it over here and show you what the finished end panel looks like on the cabinet. Okay, this is the laundry room cabinet I'm working on, and you'll notice the end panel. Well, the doors are going to have the same decoration, and of course, I've already shown you what the drawers are going to look like. And the doors and the drawers are all going to be inset. They're not going to be sitting on top of the face frame. They're going to be sitting inside the hole uh, or in flush, with the exception of the little detail that I put on. That will protrude out, and it's a really nice look but you won't see inset doors uh, hardly anywhere because they're not forgiving. You have to make sure your cabinet is dead square, your openings are dead square, and that your drawers and doors are dead square. If they're not, this, this way is not forgiving. You won't be able to square them up without it being extremely obvious. That's why uh, you'll see practically every track home in, uh, in the country with doors and drawers that sit on the outside of the face frame because it's forgiving. If it's not perfectly square, you can adjust the door so that it looks square and nobody will ever know. I like to make my doors and drawers so that they're inset and it's a really clean look. And uh, when I go ahead in the next couple of days making the doors and the drawers for this laundry room cabinet, I'll show you the entire process so you can see how I go about doing it. Okay, on to the next topic. Okay, you're probably looking at this going, yep, that's a board, I recognize it anywhere. But let me show you something. In the woodworking or in the lumber industry, we have what's called on every board a cathedral. And that's basically this, the growth rings. They call that the cathedral. Okay? Now, so what? But that cathedral will tell you which direction the tree is growing. And let me show you. You take your center ring and you measure the distance or just eyeball the difference between the end of the first growth ring and the end of the second growth ring. And in this case, it's about uh, two inches. Now, if you go to this end of the growth ring to the end of the next growth ring, it's about an inch and a quarter. That tells me the tree is growing in this direction. So let me spin the board around and show you another one. Here's another growth ring. You can see this one's longer, but you can see that the distance from here to the end of the next growth ring is about an inch and a quarter. The distance between the end of this growth ring and the next growth ring is about two and a half inches. Again, the tree is growing in that direction. 
Now that's a confirmation. I didn't need to show you both, but I wanted to show you that yes, it is consistent. So that tree must be growing in that direction. Anyway, it's the reason I'm telling you this uh, is just so for your own information, but also if you want to make a really high class piece of furniture, um, you now can say, okay, I'm going to match all of the growth rings when I glue up a piece of, or a panel uh, so that they're all going in the same direction. The reason I say that is when I was a kid, I worked for a company that made cabinet parts for Hammond organs, Thomas organs, and many other different companies. And Hammond organ and Thomas organ were so fussy that if we glued up a piece of veneer and we didn't make sure that the growth was all going in the same direction or the cathedral, they'd reject the panel. So we had to match the growth of the, of the panel with every piece that we had that forms that panel. Talk about being picky, but it's just a, a tidbit of information I thought you'd enjoy knowing. You can probably ask every cabinet guy in the country what the cathedral is and they can't tell you. They've never heard the term before. Um, you can ask them what direction the tree is growing from uh, picking a piece of wood out of their shop and they won't be able to tell you. Okay, the next topic I wanna to talk about is what's called hydroscopic moisture. And what that is, is that's the natural moisture within the cells of the tree, or in this case, the board. You can't lose that hydroscopic moisture. If you do, you lose the structural stability of the piece, and it is going to come apart. It's just going to go pop and split wide open. So the reason that's important is because if you're going to make a piece of furniture that you're really proud of and you want to hand down, if you live in an area where it gets really dry, like Nevada, Arizona, the California desert, you don't want to make your piece out of pine. And I'll tell you why. Walnut, most hardwoods, carry a hydroscopic moisture level of about 7%, 7, 8%. Okay? If you get below 8% for any period of time, you're going to start losing the structural stability. It'll take a while. A few cells will dry up, and then some more cells will dry up, and pretty soon you dry up enough that it's just going to go pow and split apart. To give you an idea, pine carries a hydroscopic moisture level of about 16%. Now, here in Arizona, it gets down to 5 6% humidity for many days on end. So you don't want to be building anything out of pine here because it will come apart. So, but if you're living in Oregon, Washington, the East Coast, where it's really humid all the time, you can build it in, out of any species you want to and it'll be fine. Just don't bring that piece of furniture to Arizona and think that it's going to be fine because it'll come apart on you very quickly. So anyway, that's hydroscopic moisture and that's cathedral and the direction of growth. And uh, now let me show you the next thing I want to show you. Okay, you're looking at that scrap of plywood with with a walnut veneer on it and going, yeah, I recognize that, it's a scrap piece of wood. Well, this is how I make my shelves. If I'm gonna make a shelf, let's say for the library units, I'm gonna be making uh, before long and you'll see that process. What I do is I make a cap detail to cover up the plywood. What this is basically is it's an inch and a quarter wide piece of wood. I plow out the thickness of the plywood shelf and then I put a decorative face on it, and this is what the finished product looks like. Now, not only is it decorative, but in a case where you're going to build library shelves, or in this case, my library units, anything you put on there is not going to fall off because it's got a lip now of a quarter of an inch on top and on bottom. The reason I have the bottom lip on here is because I use shelf supports or shelf pins, and they will lock into the back of this quarter of an inch and then the shelf can't fall off the unit. So it has a dual purpose. Now here's one that I made out of aromatic cedar. The reason I did this is because in my closets I used malamine which has got a kind of like a plastic surface on the board and it's washable and it's really great for closets and the aromatic cedar keeps moths away. So on the nice white board I have a cap of aromatic cedar. So, and I make this uh, a whole batch at a time at a different species that I use, whether it be maple or walnut, or in this case, aromatic cedar. 
and that's how I make my shells. And next time I make that, I will show you the process that I go through to make that, and it's pretty quick and simple. And I run that through my router table that I have set up, and uh, it's pretty quick and simple, and it really looks great. Uh, now, you don't have to put this detail on it, of course. You can put a complete bull nose. You can put any detail you want on the front. But that'll give you an idea of how I make my shells. Okay, and last but not least, I wanted to show you this board. Here's a piece of what they call soft maple or western maple because it's grown on the west coast of the country where it doesn't get as cold, so it grows quicker, so it doesn't grow as hard as the maple that grows on the east coast where it gets extremely cold and it takes a long time for a tree to grow because the climates are, are the winters are long and the summers are short. But what I wanted to show you here is you notice this gray material in the board? You know what that is? Some of you probably do know, some of you probably don't and I wanted to tell you. That's mineral deposits picked up by the tree in the earth from acid rain. So when it rains up on the mountains and the, the rain goes through the clouds and picks up the pollution in the air, it drops it on, uh, it, on the ground or on the mountainside and it turns into chemicals um, and the tree picks it up and it creates these mineral deposits and that's what that is. So when you're looking at a piece of maple and you see this grain going on in the maple, that's basically chemicals in the earth that the tree picked up and it caused this grain color and it's called mineral deposit. So anyway, that's my video for the day. I'm, in the next video, I'm going to be making the doors and drawers for my laundry room cabinet. And then down the road, I'm going to be doing my library units. And then that will give me a way to show you how to cut crown molding so that every single piece of crown molding that you miter, the joint is going to be dead on, absolutely perfect. In my world, there's no such thing as putty in a joint. The only time I will ever use putty is in a nail hole. Uh, if the guys that taught me how to woodwork when I was young saw me filling a gap in a piece of wood with putty, they'd slap me upside the head. So the only time I ever use putty is for nail holes, and that's even rare because they have crayon pencils uh, that you can use to match the species of wood you're using that will cover up the nail hole without any little bleached ring around the the putty because when you're using putty it's a chemical it's a oil-based putty or a solvent based cutty putty and it will bleach a little ring around the uh, spot where you put it on to fill the nail hole and you have to do an awful lot of sanding to get rid of it so if i'm not going to have too many nail holes in what i'm using i will go ahead and just finish it with the nail holes in place and then fill it with a crayon pencil that matches the species and the color of what i'm doing so anyway, that's my video for the day, and uh, hope you enjoyed it. I hope I didn't bore you to death, and I certainly don't want to insult anybody's intelligence by talking about, you know, cutting boards through the table saw. But like I said, I've seen some dangerous operations of the table saw in videos, and it kind of bothered me, and I wanted to make sure that these guys that are doing that see a safe way to do it and so that they can keep their fingers, because... I've been doing this for 45 years, and I've got all my fingers all the way to the tip. I, and it's because I respect my equipment, I don't fear it, and I make sure that my blades are always as sharp as they can be. Anyway, thanks very much for watching. I look forward to the next one. Thank you. Bye-bye.